Here we go, another edition of Sports Medicine Weekly on this Saturday morning. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. I'm Steve Cashel, my co-host, as always, Dr. Brian Cole, sports medicine specialist with Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. He is the head team physician for the Chicago Bulls, one of the co-team physicians with the Chicago White Sox, orthopedic surgeon. Dr. Cole, how are you on this uh, Saturday morning? Steve, I'm doing great. Good, good, good. No complaints. Well, we're going to kick it right off here. We've got a lot to do, and uh, we'll talk about plantar fasciitis. Boy, when I think of that, I think of Joakim Noah with the Bulls who had it. And first question, Noah, is it the same thing as heel spurs? Well, that's it's a little bit of a misnomer. That that might be the layperson's nomenclature, if you will, for it. But it's it's really not associated with a spur at all. In fact, it's very common on X-ray to have a little bony prominence at the bottom of your heel. Uh, but the the problem itself has nothing to do with the bony prominence. It has to do with the fascia. Uh, so pl- the the common term is plantar fasciitis, and that's a far more a- accurate term for this condition. Let's bring on our first guest of this edition of Sports Medicine Weekly from Athletico, a physical therapist dealing with plantar fasciitis, Sarah Ryerson. How are you, Sarah? Wonderful. Well, luckily I'm not dealing with it, but I do address it here in our treatments. Good, good, good. Well, what, what characteristics, Sarah, make someone more susceptible to plantar fasciitis? Well, the plantar fascia is basically the stick fibrous band that uh, runs on the bottom of your foot from your heel to your toes. And this location ideally positions it to maintain and support your arch, but it's really not supposed to be the primary player. This is really the job of your ankle and foot muscles, so any dysfunction or weakness in these muscles can result in complaints, as well as poor running mechanics decreased calf flexibility, um, increased activity where you're spending a lot of time on your feet, changes in your footwear, higher or low arches, and being overweight can also result in complaints. So what? So as a therapist, what you know, give us the top three or four things that you typically deploy when someone comes in with symptomatic plantar fasciitis. Because we do refer patients frequently to therapy with this condition. The things we do, we may recommend orthotics, for example, night splints. Occasionally injections are used. What does the therapist do? Well, technically, by nature of our job, therapists are specialists in evaluating and treating muscle dysfunction. So we improve any weaknesses in the ankle, the hip, the foot. And then certain athletic physical therapists have additional training in two techniques, Graston or ASTIM, and dry needling that improve soft tissue disorders such as plantar fasciitis. Graston or ASTIM uses tools to target restrictions in the plantar fascia, while dry needling knots in the muscles of the calf or leg can decrease tension on the plantar fascia. We can also use kinesio tape to support the arch and decrease the plantar fascia load that's on it. So the Graston technique is like direct, very firm, you know, you may be using some type of device, piece of plastic, other on the area. Is that to explain how you do a Graston technique? It is basically, yeah. So it's using certain tools, but we're ideally addressing those restrictions just through a different means. So why does it work? What's the, what's the mechanism? I've always been curious because it can be particularly uncomfortable, but then there seems to be some direct benefit from doing it. Well, basically, if you have some of those restrictions, um, and because of the nature of the plantar fascia, the reason you have heel pain is because it pulls on the attachment site where the location of that plantar fascia attaches. So you're reducing any of the restrictions in there by getting in there and kind of localizing those areas of restrictions even more than somebody might be able to do just by rolling a ball on their foot. Mm -hmm. So it really targets some of those restrictions. Also, we do uh, target the restrictions in the calf because a lot of times um, poor calf flexibility will result in complaints. So any restrictions in the calf tie in with that plantar fascia being tight. Visiting with uh, athletic coach Sarah Ryerson, talking about plantar fasciitis, another minute or so here, Sarah. Um, is this typical for, are you seeing athletes, non-athletes, men, women, uh, the youth? Who, who, who gets this? We see all sorts of people that tend to get this, um, and we just address any of the causes that we find. So usually the best thing to do is calf stretching, or you can roll um, a foam roll on the, ba- on the back of your calf, because a big, huge component that we tend to see in everybody is a decreased calf flexibility. Athletes can get it. Um, people that spend a lot of time standing on their job or things like that can get it. Um, people that are sedentary sometimes get this, too, um, by need to being overweight and putting more uh, load through their 
uh, feet. Great stuff, Sarah. Thanks so much for joining us uh, here on Sports Thanks. Medicine Weekly. Thanks so much for having me. And switching gears now, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the psychological aspect of injuries and recovery. Dr. Koggs, we've talked about it before. Sometimes you have to play that role of psychologist, right? That is true. I'd say more so than not. There isn't a given Monday or Thursday when I see patients that don't, there aren't plenty of tears in the office. So I will tell you the site, you know, and especially for my younger patients, but, um, you know, being taken out of exercise and uh, activity uh, can be um, a game changer for a lot of people who, are, especially who haven't been faced with much in the way of adversity. You know, so I, I think you would be, if you spent the day with me in the office, you'd be pretty amazed at sort of the psychological aspects of, you know, being hurt, not being able to do the things you want to do. Absolutely. Let's bring on our next guest, a mental health professional, Natalie Graves from the Natalie Graves Athletic Counseling. And Natalie, thanks so much for joining us here on Sports Medicine Weekly on this Saturday morning. First question, how did you develop a career that specifically focuses on athletes and their mental health? Well, thank you so much for having me, Steve. I'm, I'm honored to be here. And I, I get this question a lot, you know, how did you combine mental health and sports? And honestly, growing up in Chicago, I grew up a sports fan, right? I mean, who didn't? Growing up watching the Bears, watching the Bulls, and, and, and that's kind of what we did as a family. We just watched sports. And, and that's kind of what developed my interest in sports and athletes, just being a fan. And as I uh, began my career as a student, my eye as a fan changed. It actually became more clinical. And I started asking questions uh, around athletes, uh, around what's happening, why are they having these issues, why are they having these problems. And as, as I progressed in my education, I really started to realize that athletes really didn't have enough support as it relates to their mental health and wellness. And for someone who loves to help people and someone who loves sports, I had the, the fortune and the ability to put my two loves together. And that's how I, I started my practice, really. So what's, what's, the, what's a typical patient in your practice? So a typical patient, it really varies. It could be um, someone as young as, as, as little league age all the way up to retired NFL players and anything in between. So it really, um, it really just depends on what um, athletes, where they are in their career and what the needs are. Natalie, uh, what hurdles do mental health professionals face when attempting to connect with uh, athletes to offer your supportive services? That's a really great question. So I think one of the things that is really an obstacle is really not understanding the pressure that athletes are under. So what I understand about athletes and, and, and coaches for that matter as well is that there is a unique pressure and stress that they experience the expectations that they place on themselves, the expectations that their coaches, their teammates, and even their fans, and we're talking even on a high school level, that are placed on them, and then understanding the culture of sport, right? So when, when, we're, when we think about athletes, we think about superhumans. We think about, about heroes, and superhumans and heroes really don't get help. You have to shake it off is what we tell our athletes. And so one of the obstacles is understanding that breaking the barrier that asking and seeking help is actually a strength and not a weakness and tapping into that understanding to really get athletes to buy into the treatment and the services that I provide. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, much to the credit of the organizations that we work with uh, closely, such as the, the White Sox and the Bulls, They've taken this issue very seriously and um, to the point where we now have, you know, essentially full-time access to, you know, providers who are sports psychology background and so forth. Um, it, the, I, I, the biggest challenge, I, I think, is in, in at least in our setting is getting an athlete to sort of trust the individual and know who they're in you know, the agency issues, you know, who they're, who they're sort of an agent of and that they're available to the player and there's – you know, tremendous confidentiality in it. That's it's it's tough because it's hard for them to feel vulnerable, and you know they need a place to go that's confidential and safe. Yet, you know, you're in with, within a very large organization, so right. there, there there are a lot of challenges. Um, when I think a lot of these guys can benefit um, from from this type of access and, and information and, and processing, and most of the things are sort of reactive in nature and are pretty easy to manage. They just have to get managed and know that there's 
a place to go uh, and get it done. I, w- I would totally agree with that. Access is a big part of it. And most of the athletes that I see for the first time have never been in a therapy office, have never had any exposure to a therapist or a counselor. So building a rapport and trust is the first thing that I do. And really explaining to the person who's in front of me is that what you say to me is just it stays in this room. It's just to me. I'm not reporting back to anyone. This is confidential. And you can come in here and be safe and feel that you're not going to be judged. And you can say and do whatever you need to do. And when athletes hear that, it's it's something that connects with them where they start to understand that I can come here and be myself, whatever that looks like. And a lot of times in a lot of spaces that they, they hold, they can't do that. But when they come and see a therapist, specifically one that understands, you know, them as an, an as an individual and as an athlete in their sport, it really can break that barrier of, of concern and the lack of trust. And we can really, once that trust is built, we can really do the work of the treatment that is needed, whatever the reason they've come in that day. Great stuff, Natalie. Really appreciate you joining us here on Sports Medicine Weekly. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Natalie Graves, Athletic Counseling. When we come back here on our show, Sports Medicine Weekly, our staple Ask the Doctor segment. Stay with us at Steve Cashel and Dr. Brian Cole. Our website is sportsmedicineweekly.com. Back with more Sports Medicine Conversation after this. On 670, The Score. Back here on this Saturday morning, Steve Cashel, Sports Medicine Weekly. All proceeds from our show, Sports Medicine Weekly, go to support orthopedic research at Rush through the liveactivenow.org fund. I'm right alongside Dr. Brian Cole. Time now for our Ask the Doctor segment. Very easy to submit your questions. Go to our website, sportsmedicineweekly.com. Click on the homepage, and on the right side of that homepage, you'll see the picture of Dr. Brian Cole and I, and just click on that link, and you could ask the doctor a question. But for this first question, we bring on one of our specialists here from Sports Medicine Weekly. Nobody does it better than Karen Malkin, our board-certified integrative health coach, for this first question. Karen, how are you? Thanks for joining us. I'm great. Thank you. All right, Karen. Our first question, our Ask the Doctor segment on this Saturday, reads like this. When I eat healthy, I seem to be hungry all the time. What can I eat that is nutritious but filling? That is a great question because when people think they're eating healthy, they feel like they have to eat low calorie or not enough food. Right. And loading up your plate with vegetables has almost no calories and it's loaded with phytochemicals and nutrition and also healthy fats. And so fats are 9 calories a gram, and carbs and protein are 4 calories a gram. So you're getting more than twice the energy from healthy fats. So that would be vegetables with some avocados and some olive oil, nuts and seeds. Those will add healthy fats, and the veggies will add almost no calories, but it will really fill you up and help you feel satiated. And then, of course, having protein with every meal and snack. Great stuff. Karen Malkin our board-certified integrative health coach. Thanks so much for joining us for our Ask the Doctor segment. Thank you. And our thanks to Karen Mulkin. All right, our next question, this is for you, Dr. Cole. This comes from uh, Julie in Hinsdale. What are stem cells and are all the available therapies the same? So it's probably a timely question because we've had a lot of controversy about available stem cell therapy. So the first thing to know is that there are people out there advocating, at least in the orthopedic space, that we probably should abandon the term stem cell altogether. And in fact, maybe a better term is something called a medicinal signaling cell. Medicinal means medicine. Signaling means it it asks other cells to do things. And it probably works by harnessing our bodies to do things that it doesn't optimally do when there's a disease state. So these are cells that maybe have the potential to work locally, say in your knee or in a rotator cuff repair site, to induce your body to provide other cells to promote a healing response and improve biology. So that's the first thing. It's rare that the cells themselves are used in the classic way that people anticipate, such as the cells start to divide and create new tissue that's diseased. So people have this vision that if you take a stem cell and inject it into an arthritic joint, 
it will just magically recreate new cartilage, and that's unfortunately not the case. But if you do a repair procedure and utilize these cells, which are, again, more appropriately called medicinal signaling cells, they, they have sort of a pharmacologic you know, drug warehouse, if you will, that can produce proteins, they can actually improve the healing environment so the cartilage repair tissue is better than it would otherwise be without them. Or you can inject them at the time of rotator cuff repair, and hopefully it could improve healing rates. Those are both the subject of research studies that we're performing now at uh, Midwest Orthopedics or Rush. So I would say that to finalize the answer to that question, they're not all the same, uh, these stem cell therapies. In fact, most of them don't have any cells whatsoever. I prefer them to even be uh, referred to as growth factor therapy rather than cell-based therapy because this, it's the growth factors, these proteins that these cells or products or formulations can actually uh, provide that can ultimately lead to improved healing responses and the things we do. So lots of confusion in the area, and I think it needs to be straightened out, and that's why I'm really glad that we had that question, and this is a topic we should absolutely periodically revisit. We've talked about this before. We see in the Chicago Tribune, various newspapers, maybe USA Today, these full-page ads, right? Come see us, and we've got celebrities that endorse this stuff of we will do stem cell therapies for you, but they're very expensive, not covered by insurance. And I think our message here, Dr. Cohen, please uh, talk a little bit about this, is that be careful, right? Because it's not regulated by the yeah, FDA. I think you and... have to be buyer. You know, there is a lot of perception. And the problem is the, the, the pa- patients are ripe to be misled because they want something to happen in a very bad way, you know? So they're really sort of vulnerable to bits and pieces of information that can be said one way and interpreted another. I see that all the time. So these advertisements, these whole eight page ads and billboards that you see, they may actually be compliant in the way they're speaking about it, but patients, the, there's a lot of misperception. Alternatively, there's a, there's definitely bad actors out there. So my my response to that is it's buyer beware. And please understand that there's really no magic uh, with any of these things we're doing. And they may provide some incremental benefit but there's also probably more questions and unknowns than there are knowns uh, and answers to these questions to date. That's why we're spending so much time doing it. We provide these therapies, but there's always a caveat and a, a pretty long conversation with the patient about how they may be of unproven benefit. Not that they'll hurt, but they're of unproven benefit. May give your body an, an edge with respect to healing, or postoperative swelling, inflammation, maybe even pain. But we are actively researching it. Uh, at the same time, to really prove these 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 contentious uh, these some of these sometimes contentious statements, and they're very expensive right now. Will the price come be. down? We, I mean, the price is somewhat arbitrary. I mean, the problem is it depends on what you're using, and you know what the source of the growth factors are. So there's a lot of variability, and, and frankly, the, you know, I've seen therapies that we charge two hundred fifty to five hundred dollars for the same therapy being uh, priced at 5000 oh, yeah. So because there's no control, there's there's a, a profound amount of variability, and that, and that in and of itself is a problem in our mind. Our right, next question, Dr. Cole, comes from Julie in Deerfield. How often should you work out? It's a great question. So there's excellent literature that basically says that adults should probably do at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise or about 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise each week. And it probably should be spread out throughout the entire week. So uh, periodicity, per, periodicity or frequency is actually pretty important. So while it's awesome to be active, say, five days a week, if we did something every single day, that's even better, Steve. So basically what we do know is that in the case of exercise, it really pays to do more than the bare minimum. And those are some of the guidelines that we're now dealing with. In fact, there's some that say that more than 300 minutes, that's like five hours each week, can show further benefit. So why do we even you know, advocate for this? Because it can reduce the risk of heart disease, diabetes, stroke, hypertension, even certain cancers and, 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 and early death. So generally speaking, if you did something every day, that's the best you can do. Uh, but if you could accumulate um, a, a minimum of 75 minutes of vigorous intensity each week, that would be the bare minimum. What about rest days? They are important, right? Some people say, you know, building in two rest days per week is beneficial so that your body has enough time to recover and repair. 
Yeah, I mean, I think in part recovery depends upon the exercise or activity you're doing the day before. So I would say that you can probably do something every day, uh, but super high intensity would not be the deal. And nor should you do the same thing every day, just because of muscle memory, uh, the inability to that you know that, that to allow your muscles to recover, to start to regenerate, rejuvenate. And don't forget, it's not just exercise. Part of recovery is is proper nutrition. So feeding our muscles, feeding our bodies properly, has a, a tremendous impact in our ability to recover and also also maintain or build muscle mass, which is easily broken down if you don't give yourself a chance to recover. Do you try to do something every day yourself? I would love to. I would. Do I try to? Yes. Do I accomplish that? Absolutely not. Do you, you feel know? bad when you well, don't I seven mean, the days thing a is week? My, my, the other thing is I, my days are pretty active. Like surgery is actually fairly physical, but it's not cardio, obviously. You know, so at least I'm always moving when I'm going from room to room, talking to patients, things like that. I do not have a sedentary job. So I bet my sort of basal level or, or metabolism is generally pretty good based upon what I do day to day. But, you know, you still need some mo- at least moderate intensity. So I would say I'm minimum of two and maximum of four per week. And I, and I would like to be five or six, quite frankly. I'm just not. Weekends easier or harder? Is that when you get your workouts you know, you in? It, you, you really think try it's to rest easier, just because you know you get the time off. You get the time, but it's amazing how quickly it goes. So yeah. I think you know a rule of thumb that's worked for me and for busy people is get it done in the morning because it's the easiest thing to blow off later on or in the evening. So I'm all about my at least two days a week. It's you know six to seven in the morning, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. I try never to miss that. No meetings, no conflict. And then at least one or two other days. Usually they're one or two are going to be the weekend days. You know, so it's hard. Just yesterday, I was you know head cold, and I said I don't want to go to the gym. I just don't want to go. But I went. You probably felt and great, and I did feel great yeah. all day. Yeah, I, I, no, I, like I was almost healthy again. Yeah. I mean, it was amazing just to get a sweat, Agreed. lifted a little weights. I did twenty minutes instead of thirty minutes of cardio, yeah. but I was so happy that I took the plunge and say, you know what? Instead of not doing anything, do something. Good for you, man. All righty. The results will show. Absolutely. We're out of time, folks. Thanks so much for listening to this edition of Sports Medicine Weekly. Thanks to our producer, Shane Reardon. Our coordinating producer is Teresa Ann Seeger. I also want to thank David Cole for managing our website, our business operations, as well as Samantha Smith from Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. For Dr. Brian Cole, my name is Steve Cashel saying so long. Once again, thanks for listening to our show, Sports Medicine Weekly, here on 670 The Score. Up next on The Score, Early Odds with Joe Ostrowski. Talk with you again next week at 8 a.m. Have a great Saturday, everybody.